Hello, my name is Danielle Shreve and I'm Professor of Quaternary Science at Royal Holloway University of London. I'm a biogeographer interested in understanding the responses of mammals to climate change, both in the recent geological past and at the present day. I'm going to be talking about ecosystem services and rewilding, the process of bringing back species that we've driven to local or regional extinction and looking at how their reintroduction can be of benefit to managing ecosystems and to biodiversity. Today, we are living in an interglacial, a period of warm climate conditions. Although people often talk of the ice age as though it were just one period of cold climate conditions, in fact, there were multiple individual cold and warm episodes going back 2.6 million years to the start of the Quaternary, the current geological period. The image at the top of the slide shows a paleo temperature signal, a sequence of cold and warm events as recorded in sediment cores extracted from the deep ocean floor. As you can see, the picture is one of progressive global cooling through time, running from 2.6 million years on the right hand side to the present day on the far left. After about 1 million years ago, the warm peaks of interglacials in the red zone occur roughly every 100,000 years. They are much shorter than the longer blue troughs, periods of cold climate generally marked by the build up of large ice sheets on land. And these climate fluctuations had a profound effect on the mammal faunas of Northern Europe, causing them to shift their ranges, creating novel communities of species that look very different to those that we see today, to evolve new adaptations to aid survival, or indeed to die out if conditions became too unsuitable. We can now see, however, that vital information from these past mammal communities can help us improve species conservation and ecosystem function today. The map of the world shows the situation 20,000 years ago at the heart, height of the last ice age. The dark grey shows the build up of large ice sheets on land with extensive permafrost zones in green. The deserts in yellow have expanded because of the cold, dry climate and the tropical rainforests in red are much reduced and fragmented. This was a typical situation during the major periods of glaciation and temperate adapted mammals would either have died out or have retreated from Britain to refugial areas in southern Europe. At this time, Britain would have been inhabited by cold adapted species, including extinct megafauna, such as woolly mammoths, seen here being hunted by our earliest ancestors, woolly rhinos, reindeer, Arctic foxes and lemmings. At other times during the interglacials, the cold adapted elements retreated to their own refugia in the far north and east and were replaced by temperate warm loving species. During the last interglacial, 125,000 years before present, Britain was home to some species that would be familiar to us, such as fallow deer, but also to some that appear very exotic, such as the extinct straight tusked elephant, but which was perfectly adapted to life in British deciduous forests. Perhaps the most unusual element is the hippopotamus, the same species that occurs in sub-Saharan Africa today, but which was much more widespread across Southern Europe in the past. Summer temperatures during the last interglacial in Britain were only perhaps two or three degrees warmer than today, but sufficient to encourage hippos to expand their range northwards. You can see all the blue fine spots where their fossils have been identified on the map, even occurring as far north as Stockton on Tees and the North Yorkshire Moors. The fossil canine tooth shown comes from a very famous site in ancient River Thames gravels below what is now Trafalgar Square in central London. Today, the landscape of Britain is heavily modified by human activities. Even away from towns and cities, the countryside has experienced deforestation and removal of hedges and habitat corridors, the drainage of natural wetlands, large areas of land turned over to arable farming and domestic animals, and the canalisation of rivers. These landscapes can often be hostile places for wildlife, which experience habitat loss and fragmentation, anthropogenic barriers, restricted biogeographic ranges and fragmented populations, leading to a lack of genetic diversity, competition from invasive species, pests and disease. Few truly wild places exist in Western Europe as can be seen on this map. The Wilderness Quality Index is established on the basis of several criteria, including human population density, road and rail proximity and density, the naturalness of land cover and the ruggedness of the terrain. Areas shown in red have little or no wild land left, whereas those in green are still considered to be high quality patches of wilderness. 
In Britain, only the north of Scotland ranks highly in terms of wildness, with the blue patches being considered the most pristine habitats. In addition, we must also consider the implications of future climate change, which, which is predicted to result in higher temperatures, especially in summer, leading to more frequent droughts and water shortages, as well as an increase in rainfall extremes, especially in winter, which will enhance sea level rise and coastal flooding. The question here is how this will affect our fauna, and indeed, can the fauna itself do anything to help manage the situation? Between 1970 and 2016, the Earth experienced an average 68% decrease in global populations of fauna. Such ecological losses have a wide and detrimental effect on human society through the loss of ecosystem services that a healthy environment provides, underpinning essential cultural provisioning, regulating and supporting services. Examples of these ecological functions can be seen in the figure on the left, based on the evidence from megafauna that survives in Africa today. At the top, hippo grazing and trampling activities open up the grassland and create new habitats for other species. And they move nutrients around by grazing and defecating in the water, increasing primary productivity and promoting aquatic biodiversity. Below, elephants, open up the vegetation by debarking and knocking down trees, allowing light in for seedlings to grow and access for a huge range of smaller species. They transport seeds in their dung, contribute to carbon storage activities and consume forest fuel biomass, thereby reducing the severity of natural fires. And together, these activities have a profoundly positive effect on biodiversity. Over 60% of the globe's large herbivores are currently threatened with extinction, but in Europe and particularly the British Isles, much of this loss has already taken place. Large herbivores such as aurochs, extinct wild cattle, wild horses, red deer, bison and elk once roamed across Europe and were hunted by keystone predators such as wolves and lynx. But the increase in human settlements led to restrictions in their former ranges, habitat reduction and fragmentation, hunting and displacement from domestic animals and ultimately extinction. Ecosystem restoration should be addressed at landscape scale. For example, in coastal areas, the removal of sea defences and initiation of a process of managed retreat would allow the creation of new mudflats and salt marshes that would provide both a natural flood barrier against sea level rise and new wetland habitats. In upland areas, a reduction in grazing by domestic animals, notably sheep, stopping drainage of wet habitats and artificial burning would allow tree growth and improve the vegetation mosaic for biodiversity. Rivers, if allowed to meander naturally, would trap sediment and slow floodwaters from upstream, as would wetlands if allowed to flourish, while the new growth of peat would contribute to carbon storage. Rewilding, the reinstating of nature-driven processes, has been put forward as a sustainable method to restore ecosystems. This would involve the reintroduction of a suite of large herbivores and potentially carnivores that were here in the past. In the UK, rewilding has been gaining traction to combat the ecological crisis, but management of animals in rewilding projects is complex, with ecological, social, logistical, legal and ethical factors to consider. Free roaming large herbivores, beavers and carnivores can cause conflict with humans and concerns of human safety as well as impacts on agriculture have been raised. One of the most important case studies comes from Yellowstone National Park in the United States, where the reintroduction of wolves in 1995 after an absence of 70 years has been championed by conservationists for the positive effect on biodiversity. Wolves are referred to as keystone predators because of the disproportionately important effect they have on the ecosystems in which they live. In Yellowstone, the wolves kept deer numbers in check, allowing regrowth of badly overgrazed vegetation and thereby supporting the revival of many other species, as well as generating carcasses for carrion feeders and smaller predators. The next few slides show a selection of species that disappeared from Britain in the past and highlight the potential benefits of reintroducing them. The Eurasian beaver was a common species in the past, but was hunted to extinction before 1500 AD, largely for its fur, but also for castoreum, a substance used for making perfumes. The major role of the beaver is as an ecosystem engineer. 
Beaver dams slow the movement of water, allow nutrient rich sediment to build up and create ponds, thereby generating valuable new habitats for wildlife. Many studies of diverse groups of fauna, including fish, amphibians, water birds, and other amphibious mammals, have all demonstrated increases in biodiversity and breeding success because of raised water levels caused by beaver damming. In addition, the presence of dams slows floodwaters in upland rivers and streams, thereby offering a natural solution to flood prevention for human settlements downstream. Beavers have a natural coppicing effect on many deciduous trees, encouraging the growth of new shoots and stimulating vegetation succession. After many years, the woodland beside a beaver pond is usually dominated by a greater diversity of tree species and regrowth stages than it had before beaver occupation on account of their selective felling activities. Aquatic vegetation also flourishes, providing new sources of food for herbivores. And as of October 2022, the UK government has now declared beavers a protected species in England. The summer of 2022 was exceptionally dry in England and many ponds and water holes became dried out. However, in areas where beavers were present, their damming activities ensured that the landscape remained lush and green, as can be seen in this aerial view of a beaver modified area in Devon. Wild boar were hunted to extinction in Britain by the Middle Ages, largely for their meat, although their skins, tusks and other body parts were also useful. There are native species that form an integral part of the ecology of woodland, where their rooting activities mix soil nutrients, aerate the sediments, disperse seeds and increase the diversity of plant species. This in turn benefits the insects which rely on the plants and so on up the food chain. Studies have realized that greater species diversity occurs in most habitats where wild boar are present, indicating the significant role that they play in woodland management. Bison were formerly present in Britain during both warm and cold periods in the past, but were represented by an ancient species, the steppe bison, which died out by about 11 and a half thousand years ago. Nevertheless, a persuasive case can be made to reintroduce one of its close relatives, the European bison, which survives today in Europe, albeit in very fragmented populations. The bison is a keystone species that creates a mosaic of habitats. Their debarking creates open areas from forest and woodland that helps grasslands thrive, along with associated species such as butterflies, insects and reptiles. Their trampling and wallowing in mud and in sand baths creates niche habitats for pioneer plants, insects and lizards. And they play an important role in dispersing seeds that stick to their fur or which are passed out in their dung. And finally, the wolf, which has arguably seen the greatest reversal of fortune of any large carnivore once human populations began to settle down and keep livestock. This led to intense persecution which when coupled with habitat loss saw wolves disappearing from England probably by the 1600s and from Scotland by the 1700s. The 1979 Berne Convention states, the gray wolf is a fundamental part of the European natural heritage for its symbolic, scientific, ecological, educational, cultural, recreational, aesthetic and intrinsic value. For this reason alone, its reintroduction to Britain should be seriously considered. The major benefit of wolf reintroduction would be natural control of the red and roe deer populations, which have become too large in some areas, leading to overgrazing and trampling, and ultimately preventing the forest flora from regenerating and disrupting the animals dependent on these plants. In particular, the ancient Caledonian pine forest, which is very important for rare native species such as the pine marten and the capercaillie, has been particularly damaged by deer. Of all the species providing vital ecosystem services, however, the wolf is arguably the most controversial to reintroduce, given the perceived danger to human and livestock. But how well founded is this assumption? In summary, Britain was once much richer in biological diversity, with different species of mammals coming and going as climate fluctuated between warm and cold. At the start of the current interglacial, Britain was still home to large herbivores such as aurochs, wild horse, wild boar and elk, beavers and carnivals such as wolf and lynx. But all of these were progressively exterminated by human activities, either direct or indirect. We now know that the loss of these keystone species has had much more wide ranging impacts on biodiversity than previously realized because of the absence of critical ecological functions. 
In addition, we're currently experiencing threats from climate change, including flooding, sea level rise and droughts, as well as an ecological crisis in terms of biodiversity loss. The reintroduction of keystone species can therefore help support vital ecosystem services necessary for maintaining a healthy planet, and furthermore, offer sustainable ecological solutions to the problems that we face. For more information on our teaching and research, please visit our web pages or follow us on social media at RHUL Geography. Thank you for listening.